The Mind Bend deals with themes and subject matters that may not be suitable for all listeners. If you or someone you know is in need, please contact Lifeline on 131114 or seek crisis support in your local area. Welcome to the Mind Bend, where we discuss everything from conspiracy. They were riding an open automobile when the shots were fired. The president, his limp body carried in the arms of his wife Jacqueline, has rushed to Parkland Hospital. History. It's now universally agreed that the cataclysm was caused by a six mile wide chunk. Murder. Chris Watts handcuffed and head down in court on Tuesday as he was charged with the premeditated murders of his pregnant wife. And all things strange. Let's dive on in. What is going on, guys? Super excited to have everyone back for another episode of the Mind Bend podcast. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we jump in on this one. You can find us online everywhere now Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at the Mind Bend podcast. Please be sure to jump amongst that. Um, We've got new podcast cover art that has been done by our friend Jimmy. We'll give you a link to his Fiverr account if you want to get on some of that. He does some really awesome stuff. I advise that you guys check that out. What else have we got? Um, Also, please don't forget you can leave us questions, comments, all that at our email, themindbendpodcast at gmail.com. And if you're listening on Anchor, feel free to record a voicemail message or, yeah, send us a comment or message over Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. All right, guys, today we're going to be looking at the Cecil Hotel and the history behind it. Now known as the Stay on Main and closed as of 2017 for renovations and redevelopment, the Cecil Hotel has quite the checkered past. From its struggles during the hard economic times to several suicides and homicides, nothing seems to be off limits for this establishment. But let's take a look at the history of the Cecil after nearly being around for a century. With over 16 murders and mysterious deaths, such as that of Elisa Lamb, and even housing some of the world's worst serial killers. Although it may all just be coincidental, some would suggest something much more sinister and evil is at play. Downtown Los Angeles. It's 1924, and construction has started by three investors, William Henner, Charles Dix, and Robert Scopes. Completed in 1927, costing just over a million dollars, which is 14 million by today's value, the Cecil hosted 15 floors, including 700 guest rooms. Designed for middle class tourists and businessmen to rest their heads, with rooms ranging between $1.50 and $3 per night. Although it boasted being a modern hotel for its time, it was destined for difficult times as the Great Depression kicked off during 1929 and lasted well into the 30s as well as the development of LA's infamous Skid Row Zone in the 70s, which is still today known for its homeless population, drug market hotspot, and high levels of mentally ill. Now, the first documented death at the Cecil was in 1927, on January the 22nd. A man by the name of Orman Cook died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound when he was staying at the hotel. Leaving behind a suicide note in which he details his wife had recently left him and that he'd spent more than 40 grand trying to buy his happiness. Next, we're going to move on to November the 19th, 1931, with a Los Angeles Times headline that reads the following Search for man ends in finding body at hotel. Missing from his home at 912 Strand Avenue, Manhattan Beach, since last Saturday. According to the police, W.K. Norton, 46 years of age, was found dead in a hotel room at 640 South Main Street yesterday morning. A number of capsules believed to have contained poison were given by police as evidence that Norton had ended his own life. The capsules, police said, were found in his vest pocket. Now from here we have another six suicides or accidental deaths from falling from the hotel. Nothing too exciting until September of 1944. Dorothy Jean Purcell, who was 19, had been staying at the hotel for a couple of days with her guest, Ben Levine, age 38. It was on this morning she awoke early, feeling as though she was about to give birth and not wanting to disturb Mr. Levine, she proceeded to the restroom to give birth by herself. Now, it's worth pointing out that the restrooms in this hotel back then were kind of like a public restroom today. It's just one common facility. She believed the infant was stillborn and threw the baby from a nearby window. 
Purcell returned to her room and refrained from telling Levine about these events. She was soon after arrested and trialled for murder as an autopsy found the baby to still be alive after birth. Purcell was examined by several psychologists and found not guilty due to insanity. Now, that's that's a pretty wild event there for someone to throw their infant out the window and then be found not guilty due to insanity. From here, we're going to go forward to October the 12th, 1962. Amidst an argument with her estranged husband, Dewey, it's believed that Pauline Otten waited until Dewey had left the room before flinging herself out the window of the ninth room floor. Unfortunately, she would not only take her own life, but land on a 68-year-old male by the name of Giannani. Jeez, that's bad luck, isn't it? Amongst the investigation, police originally believed the deceased pair had jumped together, although later ruled this out as Giannini still had his shoes on and his hands were in his pockets. Some of the murders in the Cecil are still unsolved mysteries, though. One of these is that of Pigeon Goldie Osgood. Goldie was a 65-year-old retired telephone operator who had earned her name as she'd frequently been seen feeding the pigeons in Pershing Square. She was described as popular, friendly and well-liked throughout the community. After feeding the birds and spending the day out, Goldie'd returned to the hotel, had a chat with several of the other tenants as she often did, and then bid them good night and returned to her room for the last time. Several hours later, her lifeless body was found by a man distributing phone books throughout the hotel. Goldie, who had been described as a delightful pensioner, had been found beaten, raped, and strangled to death by one of the hotel's hand towels. Although the police had several suspects at the time of the incident, no one, and still to this day, has ever been charged for this crime, and it remains a mystery. Now let's jump forward to the mid-80s to one of the more infamous names amongst this hotel, the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. Ramirez was staying in the Cecil during his 1984-85 to crime spree in which he'd walk into people's homes of a night, torture and murder the inhabitants of the properties. He would then return to the Cecil, walking the halls covered in blood before returning to his room to clean himself up and nobody thought anything was odd about this. It's said he murdered at least 14 people, as well as sexually assaulting and torturing more than 20 others. When in August of 1985, he tried to break in and steal a car in which local residents of the area chased and beat Ramirez until the police arrived. However, the Cecil had a second serial killer stay within its walls. Perhaps not as well known, but just as evil, was Jack Unterweger. Already convicted and served time for murder, Jack had murdered another seven sex workers in his hometown of Vienna, Austria, before being hired in 1991 by an Austrian magazine to fly to the US and write a piece on the different attitudes towards sex work between the US and Europe. During this time, he would stay in the Cecil Hotel whilst working closely with police and going on several ride-alongs to help get information for his article. While staying at the Cecil, Unterweger would murder three local sex workers and was eventually arrested by US Marshals and extradited back to Europe on the 27th of May 1992, where he was charged with 11 counts of murder, including the three from the US. On June the 29th, Jack was found guilty of the murders and would hang himself later in his cell that night. In 2001, the hotel had a name change to stay on Maine in hopes to attract young tourists in a hostel-type setting. Although the entrance to the ground floor lobby was different, the elevators and the halls were still a common area shared by both the Stay on Maine tourists and the Cecil Hotel residents. And it's very important to understand that as we're going to go forward and discuss what happened to Alyssa Lamb. If you want to see this documentary on Netflix, I would advise that now would probably be a good time to stop this podcast to avoid any spoilers. Alrighty, for those of you that are still with us, on to the disappearance and death of Alyssa Lamb. Although I may do a whole episode on this later down the track, I just want to touch on a few key points here. The story of 21-year-old Alyssa Lamb is one of the most recent and tragic stories from within the hotel. Miss Lamb was a Canadian student on a holiday at the time of her disappearance. On January the 26th of 2013, Alyssa would check into a hotel and vanish five days later. 
Now, I actually remember seeing the elevator footage that was released to the public around the time asking for assistance. In this video, which you can still find online today, Alyssa is acting very strange and agitated and on edge as if someone's watching her. Others would go on to say that she was playing the Japanese elevator game, which consists of pressing several buttons to certain floors in a certain sequence. When this is done correctly, a lady supposedly enters the elevator and will take you to an alternate dimension. Some people have speculated perhaps she had achieved this and was still disorientated. Others have come to the conclusion she may have been drugged or under the influence and acting as if she was trying to get away from someone or something. During the search, hotel room guests started to complain about the taste and discoloration of the water coming from the faucets within the rooms. From here on the morning of the 29th of February, the hotel's maintenance worker Santiago Lopez found Miss Lamb's body face up, floating naked in one of the hotel's water tanks on the roof. The tank was then drained and cut to retrieve her body, which also had her clothes inside. But things get quite difficult from here on in. How was she able to get into the tank by herself? As whenever maintenance were to carry out checks on these tanks, they would have to use ladders. As well as how would she get onto the roof, as the door to the roof was locked, meaning she would have had to have climbed the fire escape as well as the question of why were her clothes in the tank. Now it's worth a mention that Alyssa was on medication for her bipolar disorder, although it's believed she was underdosing on her medication. And there's still quite a divide today between whether someone else was involved in the murder of Alyssa Lamb, and internet sleuths have come up with many theories, including the hotel staff being involved or being drugged and followed after a night out on the town. One man who was wrongly accused of her murder was a death metal musician from New Mexico by the name of Pablo Vergara, or his stage name Morbid. Pablo then received death threats and messages in regards to this to the extent that he attempted suicide. I just want to be incredibly clear that it isn't possible for him to be guilty of her disappearance as he wasn't even in the country at the same time. Another note worth mentioning is a really eerie similarity between Alyssa's death and the 2005 remake of a Japanese horror film by the name of Dark Water. In this film, a mother and daughter are staying in a rundown apartment building in which there's a dysfunctional elevator and discolored water coming from the hotel's faucets, which eventually leads them to the rooftop to find a girl deceased in the water tank wearing the exact same colored clothing. I'm pretty sure this is all coincidental, but it's still spooky as fuck. Nonetheless, this is all tragic. In 2017, the Cecil was closed for renovations and a revamp which will apparently include a rooftop pool. It's also now been designated as one of LA's historic landmarks due to its architecture and design in the 1920s and is due to be reopened sometime later in 2021. Some would say that the Cecil Hotel has a permanent mark of evil within its walls. Others would say this is just unlucky and an unfortunate series of events. Thank you all for your time. This has been the Mind Burn Podcast. Enjoy your night.